Hello, everybody. Welcome back to an exciting, informative, slightly entertaining episode of the Tuck Cast with a splash of bourbon. And today we are actually broadcasting from the shop in Silva, North Carolina, 530 West Main Street. And I have Bobby here with me today, the Bearded Wonder. So, What's up? Bob, yeah, man, doing well, man. What's going on, Bobby? Not much, man. We're all just kind of taking it hour by hour, day by day with the whole coronavirus situation going on. So um, we did want to make sure we give everybody an update on kind of what our situation is and what's going on so you guys can stay informed. Obviously, you can always check out Instagram and Facebook. We're going we're gonna to do our best to keep that updated through this, but with you know limited stuff and what's going on, it's kind of hard to put up a bunch of new stuff. But uh, just wanted to kind of go out, go over – where we're at as parameters, so um, both of our counties that our shops are in, Swain and Jackson, have put out a, uh, a basically, you know, a lot of businesses need to close down just for, you know, safety and things like that. Um, we still fall in a category where we don't have to close, but we have decided to um, close down the Bryson City shop just because it's a little bit more of a remoter, remoter, I don't know if that's the right word, remote area. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to keep the silver one open, and basically the reason we're doing that, a lot of people have asked us, why we're staying open because our locals still can go outside and fish and you know that's great social distancing you know go out by yourself have a good time fish get your mind off of things everybody's a little stressed so we've stayed open so people can buy some flies buy some fly tying materials things like that um, we are you know going through all the cdc precautions in the shop man we wipe down all the credit card terminals the door handles door knobs counter iPads and keyboards and bathroom and all that stuff. We've done. We've been doing that basically for two weeks now, just doing all that. So we just continue to do that. You know, keep the six feet thing. Talk to everybody, um, that type of stuff. Don't let them give us their ID if they're getting a fishing license or anything like that. Just get them to read everything to us. So you know, we're following all those guidelines, trying to stay as safe as possible, but at the same time, trying to help the public. Um, you know, like I said, have a little bit of downtime um, because you know everybody right now no matter what industry you're in, is thinking about it from a health perspective and a economic perspective. Um, I think we all, all are going to have some hard times here over the next week or two or month or who knows how long. So, you know, we'll try to entertain you as best we can. I think our plan is to still do podcasts if possible. when or what or what may or may not happen with that it may happen before this podcast airs so we don't know but uh, just want to keep everybody informed as best we can about what we're doing and hope everybody wherever you're at is you know fishing your home waters you know whether you live by a little river that's got some brim or crappy or bass or shad or something if you can get out of the house if you're you know feel good about it and it is safe, you know, do the proper, proper social distancing, all that stuff. I think we all need to mind our P's and Q's on that, not travel too far from our, our home base. And and if you can go fish a farm pond, you know, something like that, sit down and tie some flies. I think that's what Shannon's been doing some of, you know, um, Shannon actually to getting off that, getting off the serious stuff. Let's talk about Shannon actually entered a basically like the NCAA format of fly tying since there is no NCAA tournament. So tell us kind of the perspective of that, man. Yes. Um, yes, I did, Bobby. And so what happened um, was a person had come across um, where someone was potentially had thought about doing a fly tying tournament and took it to uh, the guys at Norvice. And you folks know that seen the videos I do tie on the Norvice and um, – they said, great, let's run with it. And so we actually had 32 people uh, that are in that contest, and we got our matchups this weekend. And we had to have our first fly submitted by 7 o'clock this morning, and those flies will go up for judging on the Norvice site. And as soon as I get that, I will pass that along uh, via our Facebook and things like that. I am matched up against a gentleman by the name of Michael Thomas. I don't know him. I may be the only tire in the southeast. But you do have to tie on a Norvice fly tying system, and it's head-to-head matchups, and they give you the category. So this first category was a nymph. You can tie whatever nymph you wanted to, and then it's up for judging, and it, you advance based on who gets the most likes to the next round. So each round will be different. So it's yeah. it's basically like uh, 
uh, you know, sitting around on a Saturday afternoon watching four basketball games and seeing who advances and, and how that goes. The, actually, there is the, the champion, uh, Norvice has put up $500 worth of Norvice gear from Norvice uh, tools, things That's like cool. that. So you have a choice to pick what you, what you want to get. So for me, I, I did it just to see uh, other people. Uh, right now, just kind of being from, you know, after today, being home most of the time uh, there at the Vice. Why not uh, learn something, uh, see what other people are doing across the country, and, and just kind of having some fun, honestly, with, with no, no basketball, no baseball, yeah. um, no, nothing going on out there. It just, it's just a way to take, take the mind off some things, and i um, looking forward to it. I don't know who the first ones will be judged. That hasn't been put up yet, but as soon as it does – Dell's encouraged me to do a Facebook Live thing, and if I can get the internet to work from the house pretty good, not only will I do that, I'll try to uh, maybe do a Facebook, you know, live fly time video or something like that, and yeah, just keep yeah. just keep things light. So, is does the pattern have to be something that you invented, or it can be like you can pull any pattern from anywhere and go that? So, the one you tied, we won't give away too much, but is it something that you came up with, or is it a Something that's already out there. Um, it's nothing that's already out there. I just that's wanted cool. to do a few techniques to kind of show off some skills. I think people who tie flies will kind of see what I did with that particular pattern. I did have to kind of throw a name onto it, so I did kind of make up a name real quick. But um, it's just a basic nymph with a uh, you know tungsten bead, fauceted tungsten bead. It does have two wires wrapped side by side to kind of show, because when you start to wrap those wires, you can get gaps in there, but they're pretty tight good tolerances in yeah. there did a little bit of dubbing loop as well with not only cdc but some ice dubbing too uh showing mixing two different materials together uh in that but uh braden was watching me finish that uh, fly last evening and he said dad he goes that fly looks like a bee uh and the colors on it i, I wanted contrast so it would show up in a photograph yeah, yeah. but he's exactly right we think about the teleco nymph the colors of, of this pattern here is a pattern that mimics a lot of the, the yellow jackets. I mean, the color is like, oh, wow, it's oh, eerily close to it. Yeah. Uh, Jack already said he'd fish it. Um, I'm sure it'll fish. He's it, just trying to get a free fly. He's Andy. trying to get a free fly, <laughs> uh, no doubt. But uh, I come up with something. I'm sure people will have their own things, and there'll be some stuff that's traditional that people may tie. Um, I, I think that's what's unique about it. We don't know. We have no clue what we are going to see. Yeah, yeah. So I may have missed this. You may have said this. Is it – are people voting? And it's the public that's voting, right? Um, so the public's voting. That's awesome. Is it a picture or a video that gets posted for them to vote on? It's a picture. Okay. Now, the rules are real – I see they're pretty open, but they are strict, meaning that you have to submit pictures of in-progress tying. Oh, that's and smart. And you have yeah. to be able to see the vice. <laughs> uh, so that's how they're controlling it because we're all in different places. Yeah. And some of the people that are tying are actually in this self-quarantine thing now anyway in their state. So it's a chance for them to, to do something creative and have some fun and that's take cool, their man. mind off stuff. So timing couldn't be any better. Yeah. Uh, no video, but um, you certainly we could do a video of that particular pattern uh, because it shows some techniques that people may want to try. And right now, if you got free time, why not watch a few fishing videos, maybe some tying videos, and you know get some tying materials from us. Send out some more yesterday. Just call the shop and uh, the guys. Yeah, will we're get shipping them. stuff, so. Yeah. Get that out to you. We're happy to ship anything to you for free. We're just doing all shipments for free. Normally we do fifty dollars and overs free, but with all this, I mean we we just want people to get as much as they can so they can tie and you know, keep sane. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah, I mean it's the mental health health of things. You know, everybody's kinda of worried and I think we're all kind of sitting back and honestly, uh, you know, I think we we've all kind of stressed a little bit. I've got a little bit grayer. Uh, just you just kind of wonder a little bit. Uh, we've never been in a situation like this, but we I feel like we have an impact through the podcast, through time videos, things like that. That maybe we can lighten somebody's day a little bit. Absolutely. And, uh, it's the thing about fishing. Um, I I think I mentioned that when we did the interview with myself is that we are fortunate enough to help people relax, de-stress, 
from that on the water. Now we have a chance to do it through another resource potentially, and uh, we're here for you folks. And uh, certainly w- this will pass. We don't know when, but even when it passes, you know, the, the owners are committed to being here for you folks and for the employees and certainly appreciate that, speaking on, you know, probably behalf of the guys here at the shop. But uh, yeah, we're looking forward to getting back to normal for sure. Yep, yep, I'm excited too. Especially, man, when you look out today and, the man, it is beautiful. We had a bunch of rain overnight, so the rivers are pretty high today, but – Man, the weather today makes you want to just go outside. I think that's what's going to be the rest of the week. They're talking 80s later this week up here, which is a little warm, but, man, I'll take it. Stuff's popping, blooming. It's pretty. Um, I wish everybody could come see it right now. Well, I've, I've definitely, with this uh, free time, I've got my eye on some uh, fishing uh, coming up here. <laughs> yeah. As long as they say, until they say you can't go, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do as much as I can. Try to incorporate Braden with the way the schools are. Uh, I think he's pretty. He's had a good two weeks or yeah, whatever they is. He's, you know, it's been good. Spring break, a lot of fishing. Uh, you know, we've done some trout. He's done some. Uh, he's caught a bass with his papaw. You know, on the lake. You know, Fontana. Uh, they went fishing. He hooked a big brown the other day. I've gave him crap about it because they didn't get a picture when it broke off. But yeah. uh, apparently, probably the biggest fish he's ever hooked. You know, as a ten year old, and remember those days. But it's a great time. You know, family time. It's it's maybe get a chance to reconnect a little bit, slow down, enjoy the pace of life a little bit. But uh, you mentioned the weather. With the way the weather is right now. A lot of bugs are starting to come off, and it's um, if you're here in the area locally, and if you can get out and you feel safe about it, I think you're fine. It's uh, you know those confined spaces where there's a, where there's an issue, but uh, usually when we fish around here, we're quite a bit a ways apart <laughs> yeah. from people. If yeah. if you can touch your neighbor with your fly rod, you're probably too close. And if you're in someone's local, if they're local from here, they're going to tell you that. So yeah, yeah. Keep that in mind. But uh, I did want to let everybody know, we'll, we'll do one more little service amount announcement before we move into the interview with Mike. Um, pretty much with that statement that they put out, all the lodging has been shut down. So unless you have a secondary home here or have a friend that lives here or a relative, you have no place to stay. I'm talking campgrounds are shut down, hotels are shut down, Airbnbs, VRBO, all that type of stuff is shut down. So if you were thinking, oh, I'll run up to the mountains Friday or Saturday, you know, you can't do it. I mean, there's unless you've got a place to stay. There's no place to go stay. So, um, you know, they're really taking it seriously, which is a good thing. I mean, it's everybody's health. You know, there's a, a saying out there that, you know, if you have your health, you're rich. So, you know, we all need to do our best to stay healthy and keep everybody else healthy if we can. So, But I think we're going to jump into an interview with Mike. Um, technically, uh, we're, we're pretty much blunt here. We're, we're, this was pre-recorded with Mike. Um, and hopefully Mike's doing well. We haven't seen him in a couple of weeks, which, you know, he's, he's a little older fella. He, he probably shouldn't be out. So I'm glad we got this a couple of weeks ago before everything hit. And uh, it's a good interview. It's, you know, basically about uh, some of the stuff he does. And, and he's got a big fly tying collection. So I think you all enjoy it. So uh, unless you got anything else, Shannon, we'll probably jump into that. Yeah, I think uh, just, just let people know about Mike. Mike is, uh, he's been known as a fly collector. And he has a hat, I think, that says fly collector on it. But he also does some other coordination efforts throughout uh, uh, the national park and things like that. So we thought we would bring Mike on board and, and let talk to him because it's actually some interesting stuff there that he has. Uh, but with that being said, we're going to hop into the interview, folks, and uh, appreciate you folks uh, once again turning into the Tuck Cast with a splash of bourbon. And now let's get into Mike, Mike Kesselring, the fly collector. Welcome back to the Tuck Cast with a splash of bourbon. Uh, once again, Shannon Messer here, along with me today, Bobby Bennett. And we've got a special guest here in our shop in Bryson City today. Uh, this gentleman came to Bryson City area around 1975, has been here ever since. He's been called the Collector of Collections. He does a lot of volunteer work. Uh, he's actually the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, North Carolina side fisheries coordinator. And we'll get into that. That's a that's a big title there as well. A lot of folks know know this gentleman as he makes his way around Western North Carolina, doing a lot of volunteer work with a lot of different organizations. We've known Mike for several years now. Um, uh, he's got a lot of knowledge, uh, you know, of the area. Uh, started uh, did a lot of photography at at one point in time there as well. 
And uh, this gentleman here, go ahead and inter- introduce him, is one Mr. Mike Kesselring. So, Mike, welcome to the podcast today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Glad Re- to have you, man. Yay. Yeah. So, Mike, um, tell us, um, as I mentioned there for, to you before, you've actually been in some books um, there. <laughs> you've been called the Collector of Collections as one, one of the titles that, that we kind of know about. But uh, before we get into that, tell us about your first fly fishing experience. Oh, Lord, that was so long ago. I think I was about 15 years old, and I was living in Washington State on the very tip of the state where my dad was stationed in the Air Force at the time. And the Pacific Ocean on one side and the Straits of Juan de Fuca on the other side in Vancouver Island just north. And it was a very popular salmon area. It's on an Indian reservation called the Macaw Indians. And they did a lot of salmon tour fishing. But I didn't have enough money to go on a tour, so I started fishing in the rivers that come into the ocean where the salmon would run. And the flies were long, beautiful streamer types, uh, Pacific salmon. I don't remember specifically what species of salmon, but they were about as big as some of the saltwater fish I used to catch down in South Florida when we were stationed down there. And we didn't use salmon flies then, we used shrimp. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on the salt yeah. water but that was my first experience and i would ride my bicycle around to get to these different locations well cool man that's that's awesome it's so you, you basically just kind of fished fished on your own oh yeah or, yeah 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 cool man i didn't I, I just learned from a couple of gis that were doing some of that fishing and they took me out once or twice in the beginning but at, they w- weren't able to go when I wasn't in school, so mm-hmm. I just had to do it on my own and learn by making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. I think that's kind of the story for a lot of us, a lot of mistakes. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are some viable lessons for sure. Right. That's awesome, man. That's a, that's a great story right there. Well, that's where I learned a wet wade, too. There you go. <laughs> 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 I got you. I learned a wet wade at an early age, too, because uh, I didn't have waders. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. So you came to Bryson City since 1975. Kind of, kind of. What brought you to the area, Mike? Well, my parents had moved here a couple of years before I did because they had been visiting my grandparents who had moved here two or three years before them, and they liked it so well they moved. But I was gone already, living in Indiana, and I decided I'd come and visit them because they were a lot closer to home. But at the time, I didn't have a car, so I came on the bus line. And after I got here, the bus line went out of business, and I've been stuck ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's one way to get here and stay, I guess. <laughs> I think that's the first time somebody that said they got here because the bus went out of business. <laughs> it's usually in auto parts, wait, waiting for auto parts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bus broke down at the station. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So when you got here in 1975, did you pick up fly fishing right away? Oh, or No, no. Um, I was busy trying to find a job and working in a couple of factories and restaurants and trying to get up on my own. And then I started working for my dad in a jewelry shop and driving shuttle buses out at Nanahale Outdoor Center. And after getting tired of working for other people and my photography uh, hobby had gotten started and was getting bigger I decided to open my own photography studio and did that for about 25 years but while I was doing photography I ran into a lot of people locally and made a lot of friends and went bass fishing first you know crappy fishing and then started picking up fly fishing from a couple of friends who I would go hi- on hikes with who were also fly fishing there you go neat so with that uh So when did you first start collecting flies? Because somewhere along the way, you had to buy some flies, I guess. Oh, absolutely. And and if I'm not mistaken, and maybe there's a second part to this question, do you tie flies? I have never tied a fly except to the end of my tippet. And I've never wanted to tie, but there's been a lot of fly tires who offered to tie, excuse me, teach me how to fly uh, for free just to be able to say, hey, I've got another student under my belt, and he's a collector, too, kind of story. But the idea of collecting started actually back in Washington State. I had held on to two or three of those old flies 
not knowing if I'd ever use them again because they were so pretty and the art, you know, I knew. And then here in Bryson City where I started collecting plies, it was just because I'd buy a dozen of a fly and use a bunch and the ones that were left over, I'd just hang on to like most people do. And I ended up just keeping them and buying more flies and keeping the extras. And before I knew it, I had a collection and I had gotten ahead of cataloging and keeping track of who made them or where I bought them. So I never really got into that part of it, except I did categorize them, keep them separated by style, by size, by um, color and use, you know, that type of thing. Now, with with you having the, those flies, how many flies are you up to now? Well, at, at last estimation, because I had counted them a few years ago and would just keep adding numbers to it as I bought more, but it's about 16,000. Now, is that different patterns or 16,000 total flies? Well, like six, you got, you know, five of one pattern. Right, that, right. I, I have, or is that different patterns? I have quite a few flies that are anywhere from two, three, four, maybe half a dozen flies, and maybe a half a dozen or two dozen where I might have a, a, a dozen of the same kind of flies. But all of those are older style Classic Smoky Mountain, hard to find flies nowadays. Hmm. Now, out of out of that collection, there, Mike, how are you actually organizing those flies? I can just imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, flies don't take up a lot of space, but what? How do you organize those? And and basically, like, how much room is this taking up in your? Well, they don't weigh much either. <laughs> True. <laughs> I have about sixty-five plastic divided trays. They're eight foot, excuse me, eight foot, eight inch by 12 inch boxes with lots of compartments. And I have spread those out on tables at displays for fly fishing clubs, Trout Unlimited chapters, uh, fly tires, festivals, fly shows. And to do it right, it takes about six eight foot tables to lay everything out. Not just those fly boxes that contain the collection, but I've got about 30 or 40 different sizes and smaller fly boxes that you carry to go fishing, jam-packed full of flies. And I lay those out to show folks the different types of flies you might go fishing when you're going just wet flies or dry flies. And one of the things that allows me to do when I do that is like one box has nothing but yellow sallies, about 25, 30 different yellow sallies in it different styles, different uh, stages of growth. And then the other way, I've got another box that has the same type of fly, but with 25 different names. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting how that works. Now, are they all from America? No, no, no. Not all my, all, all the yellow sallies are. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> saying like of the 16,000 are, oh, no, no. are most of them stuff that you found here. Uh, as you fish uh, over the years they have been all <coughs> purchased here in the united states or some online where i've found some interesting patterns i couldn't find in stores but anytime i've traveled around the country i've always tried to get by a fly shop and pick up a few flies specific to that area and patterns that i don't have already but over the last couple of years i've been on facebook connecting with a lot of fly tires around the world through fly fishing groups and fly tying groups. Specifically, fly tying groups are the best source for this. And I go through their photo, gal photo gallery and copy the photos and then send them to them and ask them how much do these flies cost. And most of them are kind of pricey for the style, but they're worth adding to my collection. And of course, I can only afford one, maybe two of each of those. So I, I've got country, um, excuse me, flies from countries all over the world, like uh, exotic places too, like Tasmania, Siberia, Japan, uh, New Zealand, even uh, other places you wouldn't think that uh, would be popular outside those areas, but like Scotland, Ireland, England, uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, all those Atlantic salmon countries have some beautiful ties. Hmm. Now, um, you've got a lot of flies there. Is there one in particular that stands out, and if so, why? 
Well, recently, in that endeavor to collect flies from around the world, I actually bur purchased some that were really interesting that aren't necessarily from outside the United States, but this guy up in New York ties some amazing um, striper and saltwater, big saltwater fish type flies. And the one that really stands out and I highlight in my uh, display is a, about a six to eight inch squid. It is so realistic from a distance that you'd swear it was moving. Hmm. And he tied it from a picture I sent him of one of his flies he had had in his gallery. And he had only tied like two or three others. And he was um, improving each one as he did it. And this one, I think, was his best one. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's cool. It, it was, uh, imitating it, a squid. Yeah, it was like 35 bucks for it, but it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Wow. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that, that's, that is pretty <laughs> neat there. It, well, out of, well out of my realm of expertise for sure. I know, I know I'll never fish it, but it's part of my collection. And that's yeah. what, what my collection is about. It's not about fishing. It's about the art. It's about the uh, skill and the materials. I don't know a whole lot about the types of materials, but another thing I've learned through collecting is different parts of the world have different concerns about their fisheries, like we do here in the country, in the United States. And they also have lots of different concerns about regulations, and poachers are common everywhere, just, mm -hmm. like, just like here. And uh, one of the things I learned is up in Scotland and uh, Wales area, there are problems with cormorants, where in this area, there's otters, mostly, that we uh, are concerned about eating the trout. But over there, they're eating their Atlantic salmon coming into the rivers. They aren't staying on the ocean beaches and, and just diving for saltwater. They're actually hitting the freshwater fish coming up the rivers. So I learned a lot just from talking to these people, not just their ties and, yeah. their, and their flies. Yeah, that's that's neat. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about that, actually. <laughs> Shame on me. Uh, Neil, Mike, do you um, do you have any scheduled events coming up in the future where you would be displaying your flies? I or? do. Uh, in a week, on the 10th, I'll be setting up just my international fly collection at the Catalucci Trout Unlimited Chapter meeting in Maggie Valley, at the rendezvous. I've displayed my smaller part of my collection a years ago when it wasn't as big, about three years ago. Only had about 12 or 13 flies then. <laughs> 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 but I'll only use up a couple of tables for that collection. They just don't have enough room for me to display the whole collection. But it'll be fun. They'll see flies they've never seen before. Neil, will you, uh, and I just thought of this here momentarily, uh, is it November? Um, over in Tennessee, yeah. Uh, or were you? Do you think you'll be doing that again this oh, year? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in Tennessee, Little River Outfitters in Townsend puts on a yearly event. They've done several years now, and I've been there three years in a row. And uh, they let me have all the space I need for my whole collection, and it's a draw to them because it is just fly tires that come to it. Uh, I mean, that are set up as uh, displayers. It's not a vending event, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people that come there to see these fly tires. Many of them are just fishermen, but they thought my collection would be a great draw for people who might not be that interested in the tires, but in the flies. And so it's fun watching people walking around my tables, and I bring several lit, uh, lighted magnifying glasses also for them to see the flies a lot closer and it's great to see people looking at them how curious they are they'll pick something up and and they'll ask me questions and it, it's a lot of fun it's like a giant show and tell m uh, at school <laughs> that, <laughs> and that's the whole collection you take everything yeah right right yeah. and even some uh, old books and some old reels I'll, yeah. I'll have a little extra space how, how many tables does that take for the whole collection um let me count. Hold on. One, two, seven. I, I used seven tables seven. that time. Yeah. That's a lot. Well, I needed that one, extra one for the uh, books and the reels. Yeah. Yeah. That's very well, cool. Man. That's, a, that's a lot of flies, Bobby. It, it takes a long time to display. And all those display boxes that are 8 inch by 12 inch, 
I actually pull the lids off of every one of them so that that doesn't take up as much space. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, when it's yeah. flipped open to the back, it takes up yeah. room. So yeah. And sometimes people will ask me, "Are any of these for sale?" And I said, "Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> one day I'll, I'll try to sell the whole collection, uh, and one you know, one um, historical, cultural, artistic kind of uh, museum display or, or, or there collection." You go. There you go. Neat. Now, um, so let's talk about a little bit about your volunteer work there. I mentioned about being the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and North Carolina Side Fisheries Coordinator. We'll hit on that at the end. Yeah. But what other volunteer works do you do here in the area, Mike, that a lot of folks that are listening may not know about you? Well, let me touch on just a little bit historically. Before I got into outdoor and conservation and fly fishing types of volunteer work, I could be called a professional volunteer for years and years here in town and a little bit in Silva. I was involved in a lot of um, theater group, uh, arts council, domestic violence programs, and, and pretty much anything that was non-political. I stayed away from political organizations just because it's not as much fun. <laughs> yeah. And because of my having a business in town, it was very convenient to be involved in these things because I was here in town every day and it didn't take long to be able to connect with somebody and talk about what I was involved in, recruit people, uh, share the idea, get them to come to our events, things like that. But the uh, getting involved in the outdoor and conservation things was just a natural evolvement or, or progress, progression. And I started out with um, a couple of hiking groups and photography groups that were outdoors a lot, and then started getting more and more into fly fishing. And from there, it grew into Trout Unlimited and then uh, water, which is water, what is the acronym for? I've forgotten already. W-A-T-R. Oh, Watershed Association for the Tennessee River. Yeah. And I've been on it board once before for a year or two and I'm back on it again, and we're trying to regroup and re-energize. And it takes a lot of work to be involved in all these things, but I have this habit of telling people what I'm doing in a way that hopefully they find something interesting about it that they might want to be involved. And uh, I've been known to recruit a lot of folks for different things besides just doing the work. And that's a lot of fun, getting people involved. Yes. Now, at one time, you, you were actually on the state council for TU, if I'm not mistaken. I, I was for about three years as a single member of a committee. And it was um, nice that I was just a single member because that meant I was the chair also. <laughs> and um, it was called Chapter Enhancement. And what I did, uh, what I could do, the best I could do, uh, excuse me, the most I could do for that was to travel to the different chapters in North Carolina. I even traveled to two or three in Tennessee. And the idea was to talk to some of these chapters that might be struggling with membership or needing ideas on how to attract members, uh, events that they could put on, and also ideas for their presentations in the meetings. Not just outside, you know, with like going fishing as a group or a picnic or promoting their chapter at a fly festival by putting in a, a booth somewhere. So it was just a way of helping Trout Unlimited itself in a regional way to uh, make better clubs. Some of the clubs were doing fine. I didn't need to help them. But I'd come and tell folks what Trout Unlimited State Council was doing and the opportunities that the individual chapters could get out of the state council. So. It was, I was kind of like an ambassador in a sense. Yeah, good deal. Yeah. So now you're heavily involved with the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, uh, as we know, and a lot of us know here, not only from the fisheries coordination, but uh, with the elk patrol and things like that, right, trying to right. educate people why you don't get, uh, mm -hmm. you've got to stay back 50 yards from <laughs> the animals, which people seem not to understand every, distance. Every time I try to ride one, Mike yells at me. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be glad to yell at you again <laughs> if you get out there. <laughs> it's for your safety, it is. but it's also for the elk's safety. If something um, happens where the elk starts 
acting in a way that is too friendly with people and they get aggressive also they can get put down and uh, I, I know human life is important but there's a lot of times that people don't realize that they're endangering the wildlife life because of that oh yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah and but anyway i have been doing that for this will be my fifth season coming up doing the elk patrol i call it and it's at the Oconee lefty visitor area and on up towards uh, smoke Mount campground where most of the elk fields are and right now we got 50 or 60 elk in that area there are still a bunch of elk over in Cataloochee, and that's a different group of uh, volunteers over there and i really enjoy it i, I love the interactions with people and occasionally yelling at people you know <laughs> but i try to yell at them in a nice way for their own safety yeah but uh, other times it's um, directing traffic when it gets backed up we keep the traffic moving because people will stop dead in the middle of the road and take pictures and you say keep moving please and uh, other things like keep moving so you don't get hit by somebody coming up behind you you know let them know there's a reason we want them to move yeah and that's a lot of fun the other thing i do is up on clingman's dome i'm i call it visitor host they call it interpreter which is a, a good word but it's not about languages it's about interpreting the history and the heritage of the mountains and what's going on uh, currently with all kinds of activities but uh, that is my fourth year coming up, and it's the highest, third highest mountain in the eastern United States, Clingman's Dome is, and it's a, a nice place to meet people from all over the world. One day I met people from 25 different countries visiting from their country, not living here now. Wow. And that was pretty cool. Yeah. I'd ask people specifically where they were from. So, so from a outsider standpoint, somebody coming to visit, what is the best time to see the elk, and what is the best time to go to Klingman's Dome, What, in your opinion? Oh, well, the time of year or time of time day? Time of year, time of day, give it all, so that they kind of can like plan their trip around maybe seeing some. Because there's a lot of people that probably have never seen an elk. Oh, yeah, absolutely, and, and they are not deer that have gotten bigger. <laughs> We've been asked, when do they turn into elk? Uh, when do the deer turn into elk? But the elk are usually best to see in the mornings, and late in the day when the sun is going down and it cools off and spring to middle summer when the calves are being born and then late in the fall uh, late september through october is another good time to see them and that is because of the rut season and there's a lot of activity going on a lot of bugling by the bulls Hurting the girls together. You can see some sparring where the bulls yeah, fight. Oh yeah, they'll 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 lock horns. And they do a little head button. A little rattling. Nothing real uh, life threatening to each other, but you know, challenging each other. That's a lot of fun. I've got a few photos over the years. From yeah, it's cool to see that. Yeah. You know that big bull about two weeks ago was walking down Highway 19 right here. I know. Coming from Cherokee this way. One year, a couple of years ago, two or three younger bulls were up at my house here in Bryson City, and I figured. I, since I was at work, um, they were probably just looking for me and missed me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so what about Klingman's Dome? I know it, yeah. it closes part of the season. It is it is closed from, let's see. Is the, it November or December the 1st? End of, the end of November. Yeah. And then uh, opens up the. Uh, I think it's the 1st of April. Yeah. The first is that of right? April. Yeah, I believe so. I think that's and it. And the reason is it's just too much of weather up there, too much uh, snow and ice and stuff. So they keep it closed. And it's awful cold even up yeah. there. Uh, it'll be 10, 15, 20 degrees cooler up there even in the middle of the summer. That's another reason people like it. But the best time to go there is, of course, during the time of year when the skies are a little clearer. And th that would be the cool fall days. And then uh, early spring when it's still a bit cool. And watch the fresh foliage coming out. That's yeah. really beautiful. And you can see all the way down to Fontana Lake. You can see five states from the, the tower at the top on, on a good, clear day. And speaking of the atmosphere, the mountains have gotten a lot cleaner over the years, the, the, uh, the smog and stuff like that. But there's still always going to be the clouds and the fog up there at one time or another. Matter of fact, when it's raining up there, people come up and say, is it like this every day? 
And also, just on the day you're here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just depends. That's a, that's a very true statement, though. It is, it and is. I mean, like, I've, I've been up there where it's fogged in, and if you give it 20 minutes sometimes, it's like it clears out completely. It will, yeah. You know, you just got to be patient with it. Yeah, and a lot of the movement of clouds and fog is kind of coming from the Tennessee side and comes down uh, the North Carolina side, and it's beautiful watching stuff moving down the mountainsides. Now, the other thing that I've been involved in is – leave no trace that's a <coughs> training uh, it's a school of thought about how to take care of the mountains or the outdoors no matter where you're at when you're camping or backpacking or hiking or fishing or anything like that and when you do activities like that leave no trace that's co common sense for sure mm -hmm. now the one the one thing that uh that some of us have volunteered with their mic that uh and this is kind of be where we kind of finish this up mm -hmm. here is on the the um, on the fishery side, and that's oh. the coordination of the water sampling right. uh, that the park volunteers do on a on a bi monthly basis. Talk to us about that, and then when we close, I'll get some. We'll I'll let you give some contact information for those people who might want to volunteer for that. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm always recruiting people for that. Currently, I have about 350 people in my email list that I send out notices to not very many people can come at these events but that's okay because even people that might not be able to help I ask them to share these um, emails with other people they think might be interested and I've been doing this for six years this might be my sixth year yeah coming up no maybe my seventh gosh I've had so much fun I've forgotten but the idea of getting out there and collecting water samples on a Deep Creek watershed and the Cataloochee watershed has recently grown compared to the Tennessee side. They've had somebody doing what I do for a lot longer, and they've got five watersheds. I do two watersheds, getting uh, volunteers to go hiking up into the mountains and collect samples at different sites. But also the Hazel Creek watershed is done a couple times a year but by park staff and a couple of volunteers i usually don't have to coordinate that because it's park that, that was a question i was going to ask you why is there only two areas where you why is it like nolan creek done or the econa lufty or well some of the other watersheds like nolan creek and forney creek um, are very similar to deep creek yeah and, and the amount of pollution that might end up falling out of the sky is very similar but um, they are talking about adding another watershed and they haven't said to me exactly which one it is yet, but they really have um, gotten a lot of information from this. Now, the other part of what I do as a volunteer coordinator isn't just for collecting water samples. The park staff does a lot of brook trout restoration projects on both sides of the park, and they are always looking for volunteers to go with park staff to help them out. Two, three, four, sometimes five people will help, and it'll be either a full day or up to four day uh, activities and they'll stay out there camping in some of the campgrounds to uh, uh, do the different projects. And there's five or six major projects every year from late spring through late summer. And it's quite a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work and people really enjoy working with the park staff because they feed you too. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be you got to be compensated for your for your labor there somehow That's and right. food food seems to uh, be a good uh, international form of currency. And, and everybody does get credit for their volunteer hours. They get recognized for the I've, in the years that I've been doing all these different activities as well as taking extra training courses for different things like how to handle bear activity, how to put up a res search and rescue event if you need to. I've put in over, well, probably 2,000 hours in the in these years, which you get recognized for every year, the uh, uh, hours that you put in at a volunteer banquet, which is coming up in April. And that, those are really nice. They have this big buffet spread and a lot of good food. And <laughs> so, so what, for somebody that would want to help out and volunteer what does the water sampling entail for a person and then 
I know the the projects probably are different because some might be a two day or a three day or right, a five right. day, but kind of like kind of go through the process so people that may be interested that are listening sure. would know what they're getting into. Well, the uh, Deep Creek trip starts at the top on 441 and hikes down, and it's about a 12 mile hike. And there's three sites that they collect water, uh, one up at the higher elevation down uh, about halfway, and then uh, close to where Deep Creek starts leveling out. But the uh, trip takes several hours and it can depending on how fast of a hiker you are how long you stay for lunch it can take from say seven o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon but if you just hike straight through you can get out around two o'clock yeah but i do save two mile hike by coming into the park with the park vehicle and pick you up uh, two miles in where the gravel road starts but um i also pick you up in the morning to take you to the top so you don't have to use your own vehicle and then the Cataloochee watershed is a shorter hike it's about a nine mile round trip where you start at the horse camp at um, Palmer Creek and hike up towards uh, Mount Sterling but you don't go all the way to the top you go to Onion Bed Branch or Indian Bed Creek and collect three three sites along the way and then come back down and it's a round trip and it does get a little bit steep and a little bit rocky but it is uh, only about a four to five hour trip if if that if you're not hanging out and fishing or anything like that and both of these trips while they're out i'm getting water samples in the lower elevations where um, i can pretty much drive right up to each site <laughs> but it's it's a lot of fun and you get to meet new people People interact with people that uh, they've never met before. A lot of friends have been uh, friendships have been made through this activities. Yeah, it's fun. I, I I think you did it too. You've done it before, right? Yeah, I, I had a chance to do it one time. Me and Shannon with, both have. Yeah, yeah, with uh, Heath Hyatt. Doctor Dave here locally does it about every time. Doesn't yeah, he, Mike? he's been doing it for two or three years now. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, he's been uh, doing it, and it's a good thing people. Uh, that go with him uh, feel comfortable because of him being a doctor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, he, he is actually a, a physician. This we, we just call him Dr. Dave, but yeah. a really good fly fisherman and uh, a very interesting person. So, Mike, so people that might want to contact you to uh, reach out to you um, so they could be maybe put on this list for volunteering or even maybe talk to you about your fly collection, how should they contact you, Mike? Well, the best way is my cell phone. I really like direct communication and it's uh, 828-736-6929 and then my email is m-i-k-e-s-s-e-l-59 at gmail.com and I, I respond to emails within a day and the uh, best time to do that I mean, the, the times I usually respond to emails is at night, so you might not get it till the next morning. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to put that, like, in the, the description of the podcast? Yeah. yeah we'll, that we'll way we, people can pull it up when they – Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll make it as easy as we can there for you for sure. Well, that'd be great. Yeah, man. Awesome. Well, Mike, um, I appreciate you coming in and talking to us today and, and shedding a little light on something that's unique um, that you do that I think most of us, we collect flies if we fly fish, but we've never really thought of it like you have. Right. You're the, you're the only fly collector I know of, like well, in I, the sense of a true collection. I'm the only one that I know of, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I know a lot of fly tires, and a lot of them collect materials. And when I have, throw this in real quick, when I have gone to fly clubs and, and fly chapters to talk about my collection i have a couple of jokes and one of them starts out saying i know that probably every one of you fly tires started out by robbing your wife's sewing kit <laughs> yeah and that always gets a laugh yeah that's that's very true <laughs> well good deal man well i know it's, it's been fun for me i've learned some stuff that i didn't know about you that i thought oh. i probably knew about you uh -huh. i can't speak for for bobby for sure but we certainly <laughs> appreciate you coming by mike well, yeah, yeah man thank you i enjoyed it Yep, appreciate well, it. Well, good deal. Well, folks, we appreciate you listening to this interview here with Mike Kesselring. Uh, you know, be sure to continue, you know, follow us, like us there on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, be sure to share our podcast with all your friends out there. And certainly, thank you once again for listening to the Tuck Cast with the Splash of Earth.